welcome back to another MIG Labs lesson. Today's lesson is going to be on diabetic ketoacidosis. Diabetic ketoacidosis, or more commonly known as DKA. DKA. So that's what all of our lesson today is going to be about. Before I get started, uh, as always, make sure you go to the MIG Labs website. We have a lesson outline in PDF form that you can download and follow along on your computer or print off, follow along in person. Uh, like I always say, it's got a little more details. It probably explains things a little bit more clearly than I do when I'm talking. So take a minute, go to the website, miglabs.com, download that uh, lesson PDF, and follow along. So DKA is a disorder that's characterized primarily by two conditions. The first one is hyperglycemia, having a high blood sugar, hyperglycemia. And the second condition is what we call ketoacidosis, Keto acidosis. And we're going to dig in deeper to what these mean, but basically ketoacidosis is when you have metabolic acidosis, so your blood pH is lower than normal, and it's caused by ketone bodies, so ketoacidosis. Acidosis caused by ketones. The reason we care about DKA is because it is a life-threatening condition. Life-threatening. Uh, DKA can absolutely kill someone if it's left untreated. In fact, it's even been called the most serious of the diabetic complications or the diabetic emergencies. So of all the complications related to diabetes, arguably DKA is the most serious. Now the good news is that DKA is absolutely treatable. As a matter of fact, when treated properly, DKA has a mortality of less than 1%. So less than 1% of people die if they get proper treatment for DKA. That said, it's on the rise. So just in approximately the last 20 years, we've seen almost a doubling in the number of patients who are admitted to hospitals for DKA. Back in 1988, when this study first looked at data, there were 80,000 hospital admissions in the uh, United States. 80,000 people were admitted with DKA. When they looked again in 2009, that number was 140,000. So like I said, almost doubling in 20 years the uh, admissions to hospitals because of DKA, which means that as pre-hospital providers, we are absolutely seeing an increase in patients with DKA. We're, we're going to be bringing these patients into the hospital. We're going to be seeing it more commonly. So it's important that we know how to treat it and what's going on. All right, so I'd like to quickly just do a very brief little uh, tidbit here on cellular energy, meaning how do the cells in the body get energy? Uh, every cell in the body needs energy. Without energy, the cells die, and if the cells die, then the person will eventually die. So when I say brief, I mean seriously. You could spend days talking about this. We're going to spend about two minutes. So I'm going to draw a little diagram here. This is a blood vessel. Imagine. And it's got some red blood cells and all sorts of other goodies in it. And we'll draw some cells right here. So these are just some cells in the body. And this could be anywhere in the body. We're not talking about a specific area here. So here are four little cells, and they've got a little nucleus. So these cells are fed by this, this capillary right here, this blood vessel. And so I already pointed out the red blood cells in there. Let's pick a G green for glucose. And there's these little glucose molecules that are floating around because the person has just eaten a meal. So these little glucose molecules. And for the cell to get energy, it needs glucose. Glucose is the primary source of cellular energy. So somehow all these little green glucoses that are floating around in the blood need to get into the cells. And the way that normally happens is after you eat a meal, your pancreas releases insulin. So I'm going to draw these little gray insulin dots. And you know what? Here, let me try this. I'm going to put a little legend over here because we're getting a lot of colors. So gray is for insulin. The G for green was for glucose. And I think that's pretty much all we've got so far. We'll go ahead and just to make things really clear, clarify that the red is blood. And the yellow are cells. Any body cell. All right, so back to our insulin. We've got these little gray insulin molecules that get released into the bloodstream after a meal. And these insulin molecules find their ways to the surface of these cells right here. They find their way to the surface of these cells. And the cells have these surface receptors that can detect the insulin. And as soon as they detect this insulin, that's how the cells know it's time to start taking this glucose in. So they can start bringing this glucose, draw a little arrow, into the cell. And we can get glucose inside the cell. And now the cell can make energy and it's happy. 
where we run into problems, especially in type 1 and type 2 diabetes, is some sort of issue with the glucose. So let's start over here with type 1. Type 1 diabetes is insulin insufficiency. So basically the body doesn't make enough insulin. So let's draw the same image. We've got our blood cell, I'm sorry, our blood vessel, our capillary with some red blood cells in it. And we've got, I'll just draw a couple cells up here. I'll just do three this time. And our green glucose, we've got our, it's not actually green, that's just for the demonstration here. So we've got our glucose floating around inside the blood. And there's plenty of glucose in the blood because the person can eat the meal and they can get their glucose, but the insulin isn't there. There's not enough insulin. So we'll draw maybe just one or two little insulins in here, little insulin molecules. And there's not enough, and the glucose cannot get into the cell. The cell doesn't know to take up the glucose. And so there's an energy deficit there. With type 2 diabetes, it's very similar, but what we see is insulin resistance. And so the cells start to become resistant to the insulin. The insulin is there, but it's almost like the cells are ignoring it. So here's our cells, our little nuclei. Draw a couple red blood cells to keep everything consistent. Once again, we've got plenty of glucose in the cells, plenty of circulating glucose. And this time we actually have enough insulin. There's no shortage of insulin, but it's coming here and binding to the cells, and the cells are basically ignoring the insulin. They've become resistant to it. And so you're not getting that glucose uptake. So those are the main differences between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Either way, the end result is the same. The end result is that we're not getting enough glucose into the cells. The cells aren't able to create the energy they need. And so the body starts to switch to the backup method. That's releasing the ketones that the cells can use as an alternate energy source. So this brings up a good point here. A lot of people get confused because we have a patient who's hyperglycemic. So they have very high levels of blood sugar, but we're saying there's not enough glucose in the cells. And that seems to kind of not make sense. How can you have too much glucose and not enough glucose at the same time? As you can see here, when we talk about hyperglycemia, typically we're in the field doing a finger stick to check our blood glucose levels. You know, you um, poke the finger and you check the blood glucose there. So you're measuring how much glucose is in the blood. You're not actually measuring how much is in the cells. And when you're in diabetic ketoacidosis, you've got plenty of glucose in the blood. As a matter of fact, you have too much glucose. It's high because none of that glucose is being pulled up into the cells. It's all sitting in the blood. So as we said, when there's low glucose getting into the cells, we can start using ketones instead. And ketones are just molecules that the liver breaks down. Uh, they break fat and proteins down into ketones when there's a shortage of glucose. It's, it's a backup energy source. So we're not normally using ketones. Our cells aren't normally using ketones as energy. But in a pinch, they can use ketones as an alternative to glucose. Now, if the body is getting more than half of its energy, more than half of its cellular energy from ketones, we have a term for that. We call that ketosis. The body is in ketosis. More than half of its energy is coming from ketones. And most of the ketones that the body uses for energy are also acidic. We call those keto acids. Acidic ketones are keto acids. Now, if we have a relatively small amount of keto acids being used, the body is able to handle that. It can buffer that acidity and bring the pH back to a normal level. It's not a big deal. The problem is where you get into ketosis, where over half of the body's cellular energy is coming from ketone bodies. Now we have a lot of keto acids, and the body loses its ability to buffer that pH. So as these keto acids build up, we're going to see a decrease in the pH or an increase in the acidity. Same thing. Different ways of saying it. Now, as you may or may not know, the body has a very low tolerance for changes in pH. The body likes to have a very specific range of acidity inside of the blood. And when you get out of that window, it does some very bad things. So when we have a pH that is too low or an acidity that is too high because of a buildup of keto acids, we call that ketoacidosis. So in other words, we're using all these keto acids the acidity is building up and building up and building up, and it finally gets to a point where the body is no longer in its happy little range. We have too much acid because of these ketones. We call that condition ketoacidosis. So there we go. We've kind of described what DKA means, diabetic ketoacidosis.
It is a condition in which the body becomes too acidic because of ketone bodies that are now being used for energy instead of glucose. And there's even more bad news. So one of that pieces of bad news is that hyperglycemia causes what we call osmotic diuresis. Osmotic diuresis. Basically, it causes the kidneys to start getting rid of more fluid because there's so much glucose in the blood, the kidneys sense that there's this increase in dissolved substances in the blood, in this case glucose, and it starts to dump fluid off and the patient will be urinating much more frequently than normal. We'll talk about the symptoms later, including polyuria. And so as the body is getting rid of fluids, now we can actually become dehydrated. And you can even suffer from hypovolemia. The body can get rid of so much fluids that we start to have circulatory issues. So this hyperglycemia is causing diuresis, we're becoming dehydrated, we're becoming hypovolemic, and it gets even worse with the fact that during DKA, the body starts releasing stress hormones because it's under stress. It's not getting the energy it wants, and so it starts releasing these stress hormones. These are things like epinephrine, glucagon, cortisol, growth hormone, to name a couple. And these inhibit the kidney's ability to get rid of the ketones. So as the ketones are building up and up and up, our body's ability to get rid of them is getting worse and worse and worse. So it's sort of like a, a spiral. It, it throws us into this very bad downward cycle that results in extreme DKA. So who suffers from DKA? Who is affected by DKA? It's primarily type 1 diabetics, or is it's also sometimes called juvenile onset diabetes. So people who have type 1 diabetes are most commonly affected by DKA. It's also possible in type 2 diabetics, and usually people with type 2 diabetes are more likely to suffer from DKA with a couple conditions. So one of them is infection. They're more likely to get DKA if they have an infection. And very often that's pneumonia or a urinary tract infection or UTI. Pneumonia, UTI. So these will predispose them to DKA. Also in trauma. And if they have cardiovascular emergencies or other sorts of major emergencies. I'm trying to cardio here, but cardiovascular emergencies. So these are the people who are most prone to DKA, or where you're going to see it the most often. Some signs and symptoms of DKA. Obviously, there's the hyperglycemia. There's the increased blood sugar. There's also metabolic acidosis. Now, most of us don't have any sort of blood chemistry testing capability, so we can't confirm this. But if you do, you will see acidosis. It's also possible to estimate the acidosis using entitled CO2. There have been a number of studies that have come out lately that have shown that using capnography, using entitled CO2, can actually be a fairly accurate predictor of blood acidosis. So that's something to keep in mind there. Some other signs and symptoms that were going to be a little more easily observed or measurable by us in EMS are polyuria, which literally means multiple urination. So they're urinating a lot. And that's because, like we talked about earlier, there's that osmotic diuresis. The kidney is trying to get rid of this excess glucose, and that's not doing too well, but it ends up getting rid of all this fluid instead. So patients will state that they've been going to the bathroom a lot more than they normally do. There's also polydipsia which means uh, literally multiple thirst so or multiple drinks. So patients become very thirsty. They're drinking more. And this is because the body is trying to bring down the concentration of glucose by bringing in water. And it, it creates this sensation of thirst in patients. So oftentimes they'll be very thirsty and they'll be urinating much more frequently than they normally do. Let me come back up here to the hyperglycemia. When we measure it, typically it'll be between 350 and 500 uh, milligrams per deciliter if you're in the U.S., or 19.4 to 27.8 millimoles per liter. I'm um, sorry, 27.8 millimoles per liter if you're elsewhere in the world. So typically DKA is in that range, and it's almost always less than 800 milligrams per deciliter. Or again, if you're in the rest of the world, that's 44 millimoles. Oops, forgot an M millimoles per liter. If it's much higher than that, 
chances are the patient's suffering from a different condition known as hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome, HHS. And we'll talk about that in another lesson. So keep in mind for DKA, generally speaking, it's less than 800 milligrams deciliter of a blood glucose or less than 44 millimoles per deciliter, depending on which unit you use in your agency. Less than 800 or 44 blood glucose measuring. And hopefully you know those units, I'm not going to write them. Milligrams per deciliter on the top, millimoles per liter on the bottom. So some other symptoms we might see. If the patient has severe acidosis, so if the DKA has progressed far enough, you might see an uh, altered level of consciousness or an altered mental status because that acidosis has started impacting the brain's ability to function normally. This is usually a much later sign. This is very late stage DKA, but something you might see if you find a patient who's progressed that far. Now in children, there are a few signs and symptoms that you'll see more frequently than in adults. Those are abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. I'll just combine those here. You can see these in adults, but they're much more common in children with DKA. And now in all patients, adults and children, if the DKA progresses far enough, you'll start to see what we call Kussmaul respirations. Kussmaul respirations. And these are the very rapid, very deep respirations. So if we were to draw sort of a graph here, on the bottom is time, and on the top is your depth of respiration. I'm just going to write DR for depth of respiration. You see a pattern that's kind of like this, very deep and very rapid respirations. Kussmaul respirations, we call those. Again, this is a later sign when the DKA has progressed further on but it's something you might see. And one final sign I want to talk about would be a subset of signs and symptoms related to the hypovolemia. So again, in late stage DK, if it's been going on long enough, you might see signs of hypovolemia. These are things like decreased skin turgor or the tenting on the skin. So if you pull up on the skin, instead of snapping back into place, it kind of hangs out in a tent for a little bit. Dry oral mucosa, so their gums or their tongue or their mouth might be drier than normal. Tachycardia, increased heart rate, which is again just a response to the hypovolemia. And in severe cases, you might even see hypotension. So again, if it progresses far enough without being treated, you're going to start to see a drop in blood pressure as the body loses its ability to compensate. And of course, like I said, these are all just a subset of hypovolemia. These aren't signs and symptoms of DKA. These are signs and symptoms of hypovolemia, but that can occur because of the DKA. Obviously, if you start seeing these signs and these symptoms, you need to be a little more worried because this means your patient is much sicker than, say, if they just have some polydipsia or some polyuria. All right, so we've got a patient. We've decided that we think they're suffering from DKA based on a history of diabetes, based on these signs and symptoms. And so now how do we treat it? There are two primary goals in treating DKA. Treating DKA. There are Two problems we want to address sort of independently from each other. So the first one is the dehydration. As we just said a minute ago, if the DKA has gone on unchecked long enough, the patient will start to become dehydrated, and that is a very serious medical emergency. So we need to treat the dehydration. The first step would be with fluid resuscitation. So if the patient has lost fluid, we need to replace some of that. Most standard protocols suggest normal saline, and they suggest 500 to 1,000 milliliters in the first one to two hours milliliters in the first one to two hours. Also worth noting is that some studies have shown that normal saline is a little bit better than lactated ringers when it comes to fluid resuscitating DKA patients. So if your patient is dehydrated, make sure you replace some of those fluids, starting with reasonable amounts of fluid, only 500 to 1,000 milliliters in the first one to two hours. We're not trying to dump as much fluids as we can, as fast as we can, but a reasonable 500 to 1,000 milliliter bolus spread out over one to two hours, preferably normal saline. The second goal is to treat the acidosis. So we said a minute ago we want to treat the dehydration by using some fluid resuscitation. We also want to treat the acidosis. Now this is a little bit tougher pre-hospitally because we don't generally have many good things with which to treat acidosis. Most sources agree that the best way to approach this in a DKA patient is to give them insulin. Now, of course, the insulin won't address the actual acidosis, but it treats the underlying root cause. So it'll treat the hyperglycemia, and then as the body starts to correct itself, it'll also correct the ketoacidosis without you having to do anything extra. This is sort of preferred. 
generally speaking, I'm going to put this in red because it's uh, what we don't want to do. Generally speaking, we don't want to use sodium bicarb. So it's obviously a base, it's an alkaline, and we can use it to bring the blood pH back up. However, it is not recommended that you use this pre-hospitally because it can cause rebound alkalosis. In other words, you overshoot and bring the pH too high. It can also cause worsened hypokalemia, some paradoxical central nervous system acidosis, an increase in intracellular acidosis, and prolongation of ketosis. So a lot of things in here we don't want. So I'm going to go ahead and cross it out just as a signal here. Do not use sodium bicarb unless you have very severe, very extreme acidosis. And we define that as a pH of less than 7. Less than 7.0. So if only use sodium bicarb if the patient has extreme acidosis. If they have moderate acidosis, treat the underlying cause. Don't touch the pH. So those are our two primary goals pre-hospitally. And like we said, the main thing we're going to be doing is treating the dehydration. We're going to be giving them some fluids. Not a whole lot we can do for the acidosis. However, it is also worth noting that long-term, one of the goals, like when they get to the hospital, is going to be to correct the hyperglycemia. So we just talked about how uh, you can use insulin. Correcting, sorry, I'm interrupting myself here. Hyperglycemia. I wish I were a faster writer. So like I said, not something we're going to do so much in the pre-hospital setting, but in the hospital, they're going to try and correct that hyperglycemia. So we just said you can use insulin. And the old school of thought used to be that you would give these very large bolses of insulin to bring down the blood glucose levels as quickly as possible. You wanted to try and as rapidly as you could correct the hyperglycemia. The problem is that some studies have now shown when you give aggressive insulin bolses like that, it actually doesn't help the patient any more than if you were to give them sort of a slower, more reasonable infusion of insulin over a longer period of time. Both patient populations have um, at least as good of outcomes. And in some cases, the patients who get the large boluses of insulin do worse. So large bolus, not so good. Not so good. And now there's a lot of research showing that aggressive insulin therapy can cause overshoot hypoglycemia. So we accidentally give too much, bring that blood sugar down, now it's too low. And that's a much more life-threatening emergency, hypoglycemia. And it causes cerebral edema, so swelling of the brain. That's actually the leading cause of death during DKA treatment. Most patients who die while they're being treated for DKA die from cerebral edema. So small infusion or slow infusion, I'll say, giving insulin over a slower period of time at a much more reasonable rate is much better, according to lots of recent studies. And they'll actually, if you go to the ICU, you'll see this corrected over the course of hours or sometimes even days. So that's just a little long-term information about what's going to happen to your patient after you get them to the hospital. The bottom line for EMS, the main thing we're going to do here, let's write this up, bottom line for the pre-hospital setting, you want to treat the dehydration. That is what's going to kill the patient much more quickly than anything else. Uh, and that's also what we have the power, we have the ability to fix pre-hospitally is that dehydration. So I hope you've learned something about DKA. If you have any follow-on questions or something wasn't clear or you think I was wrong on something, it happens all the time, go ahead and go over to our website, miglabs.com. There's a form there where you can submit questions and you can submit suggestions or clarifications. You can also leave a comment on the YouTube video or a comment on the lesson page on MIGLABS. No matter how you do it, eventually we'll see it. We'll try and get you an answer as fast as possible. So thanks for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you all on the next lesson.